exist to see God glorified and disciples multiplied through the power of the gospel. If you have your Bibles, please open them to John chapter 11. John chapter 11, we're going to be starting in verse 45. While you're turning, let me remind you that this chapter is the turning point in John's gospel. Last week, we saw Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. And that was the final miracle of this gospel before Jesus goes to the cross. And the reason for that is because this miracle is the turning point in this story. Even though there's still 10 chapters left, we're probably only a month or so away from the cross. And it was because of this miracle, raising a man from the dead, that was the final straw why the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders decided to kill Jesus. So let's pray, and then we'll read about the miracle and why it made these people want to kill Jesus. Our Lord and our God, now as we hear your word, fill us with your spirit. Soften our hearts that we may delight in your presence. Sharpen our minds that we can understand your truth and shape our wills that we may desire your ways. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Mark Twain once said, denial ain't just a river in Egypt. Most of us have experienced denial at one point or another in our lives because it's easier to deny a hard truth than to face it. For instance, back in 2002, the king of pop, Michael Jackson himself, gave an interview in his home because he had recently paid $34,000 for a gold-plated Egyptian sarcophagus. Michael Jackson was showing off his replica of King Tut's coffin, and the reporter who was interviewing him asked him, why did you buy this? Which I think is the question we all had in our minds. Michael Jackson replied, it's a work of art. The reporter replied, would you like to be buried in something like this? Jackson replied, no, um, I don't ever want to be buried. What would you like to happen to you? Well, I want to live forever. And as many as you know, Michael Jackson did not, in fact, live forever. In 2009, he did die and he was buried, not in that sarcophagus, but in a gold-plated coffin. Denial is one of the most common uh, attitudes after the death of a loved one. And this morning we pick up in John chapter 11 in the aftermath of Lazarus's funeral. But at the end of this chapter, we find a very different kind of denial than the one that we're used to after a funeral. In the wake of Lazarus's resurrection, many believe, but there are some who seek to kill Jesus. How is that possible? How does that make any sense? You'd think if we saw someone raised from the dead, there would be no no's. There would be no one who did not follow Jesus. Everyone in that room would be a follower of Jesus. That just logically makes sense to us. I know so many people today who would claim if God showed up and he proved that he was real by some kind of miracle, then I would finally believe. But until that, I'm not. But I don't think that's true. Logically, that kind of statement makes sense. But on a spiritual level, there is so much more going on in our souls and in our hearts than we're even aware of. I've been here for just a year in Brant Lake, but I'm convinced I could walk across the mill pond, walk on water, go to the hub, grab a sandwich, walk back. And there would still be many in our community who would not believe. Why do I say that? Because I've asked about half a dozen of my neighbors this question. If I could give you enough evidence to convince you beyond a shadow of a doubt that Christianity is true, would you get on your knees and worship Jesus? And I haven't heard a single yes yet. Sometimes sharing your faith can can be so incredibly frustrating because you will see the smartest, the most logical, the most intelligent people in the world And then when it comes to spiritual matters, they abandon all rationality. Why is that? Let me tell you, because they're spiritually dead. They have ears, but they can't hear. They have eyes, but they can't see. I love testimonies where someone is radically saved from drugs or addiction. But the stories 
of people who are churchgoers who say, I had heard about Jesus all my life and I believed in my head, but I never trusted him in my heart. And then one day it clicked. We recognize that the alcoholic needs a miracle. Right? But we forget that so do the religious. And my prayer this morning is that as we examine how the Israelites responded to Jesus, that we would rightly respond to him and that we would not live lives of denial. Because in John 11, we're going to find three responses to the raising of Lazarus. We're going to find that some respond to Jesus with faith. That makes sense in verse 45. We're going to find that some respond to Jesus with violent opposition. That's most of the text here in verses 46 through 54. And finally, we're going to find that some respond to Jesus with shallow excitement in verses 55 through 57. Some respond with true faith, some with violent opposition, and then some with shallow excitement. So let's start with true faith. If you'll look with me to verse 45. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. Oh. That's strange. I just wanted to set the mood for that. Um, that was an altar call mode. They, they heard the music and they walked down the aisle. <laughs> and they believed. After four days of being dead in the grave, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus miraculously walked out of his own grave. And many believed. These people had put Lazarus in the tomb to begin with. They had been mourning for four days. And when they rolled away the stone, they could smell the odor from Lazarus's decomposing body. So when Jesus resurrected Lazarus, it was only natural for them to believe. But in verse 45, we find something that is almost as unbelievable as a man rising from the dead. The reason verse 45 is so unbelievable is that it should say, all of the Jews, therefore, believed in him. But instead, it says, many of the Jews believed. It makes sense if it was an altar call, if it was a revival, if it was a church service, you get that all the time. Some believe, some don't. It's what you get. But usually those services are not preceded by someone raising from the dead. And the first response to Jesus is simple faith. But the second response is not faith. It's violent opposition. Not only do some of the Jews there not believe, but verse 46 says, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. When these individuals witnessed the power of God firsthand through Jesus, instead of falling to their knees in worship, they ran to the Pharisees to report what Jesus had done. They run to the very people who we know are actively seeking to kill Jesus. They had more evidence to believe in this moment than most people do today. They had more evidence to believe that Jesus was who he said he was. So logically, why didn't they believe? It wasn't because of a lack of evidence, because of a lack of will. Remember John 3.19 that we read earlier. Sinners do not want to come to the light because they don't want their deeds to be exposed. In the same way, a criminal does not go looking for a police officer. So someone that loves their sin, and they love the darkness, will not come to the light. So Romans 3 actually makes this declarative statement. No one seeks for God. No one seeks for God because while they love their sin, their sin produces shame and guilt. Think about all the way back in the garden, Adam and Eve. They committed the first sin and in that moment they realized they were naked and they were ashamed. And then they tried to cover up their own nakedness with fig leaves. And ever since the world has been following in their footsteps, ever since we've been seeking to hide our own sin and our shame running from the light. Our hearts are so much more sinful than we could ever imagine. The gospel of our culture is this, follow your heart. There are millions of voices today that are preaching that you should believe in yourself and you should embrace your truth and you should live out your authentic life. And those voices are lying. They're lying. 
The Bible says that there is a way that seems right into a man, but in its end leads to death. The Bible says the heart is wicked and deceitful. Who can know it? That's why I say do not follow your heart. Don't trust your desires. Don't be your true self because your true self is sinful. It's wicked. That's why we need to be born again, radically remade into a new creature and new creation. Our culture is constantly preaching that you are your desires. And if you deny yourself what your heart desires, then then that's not a good life. That's a bad, that's a lesser life. But your desires do not define you. Your Your desires can often mislead you and cause you to abandon all logic and reasoning. And here in this scene, logically, if you saw Jesus raise Lazarus from the grave, yeah, you would believe in him. But the human heart is so sinful that it causes these individuals to abandon logic and seek to kill him. It takes more than evidence to convert someone's soul. What it takes is an act of almighty God to open our eyes because unless God does that, we're always gonna follow our sinful desires of our heart. And that's where Christians realize that that as I'm saying, don't follow your heart. Know that God has taken out your old heart, your heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh and given you new desires. And so even when you sin, you say, I don't desire to do what I'm doing. And I do desire to not do, it's that, it's that struggle that Paul has with sin in Romans, that you have conflicted desires, new desires by God. There were many people who saw Lazarus rise from the grave and God used that miracle to open the eyes of many that day and lead them to faith in Jesus. But there were some who followed their hearts and they went to the Pharisees. And in verse 47, it says, so the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council. Stop right there before we read on in verse 47. That's a weird sentence. And we need some background information to just understand how weird it is. The council which gathered went by the name of the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin was like the high court of Israel, their Israeli supreme court, the religious rulers of their day. It was the highest level of leaders in Judaism. And there were some who were Pharisees on the Sanhedrin, but mostly it was made up of Sadducees. And the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they despised each other. Because in a lot of ways, the Pharisees, they were the fundamentalists of their days. And the Sadducees, those were the flaming liberals. The Pharisees held to the strictest interpretation of the scriptures, even adding their own interpretation as equally authoritative. But the Sadducees actually were not very religious at all. They were primarily political. They actually only believed in the first five books of the Bible, and they rejected any notion of spirituality, angels, demons, or an afterlife. The Sadducees did not believe in a future resurrection, and that's why they were sad, you see. You may have heard this before. That's how you remember the difference between Sadducee and Pharisee. They rejected any future resurrection resurrection. And so in verse 47, you have these two groups who despise each other because their beliefs were so opposed to one another. But here they have come together because of their common enemy in Jesus. The Pharisees hated Jesus because he claimed to be one with the Father. It was theological. And the Sadducees hated him because he preached a resurrection. And so this miracle would have really ticked them off. That's why I think the raising of Lazarus was the final straw, finally, for the Sadducees. And that's why in verse 47 it says, So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. This strange scene gets even stranger. The Pharisees and the chief priests never denied that Jesus had the ability to perform miracles. And I want you to think about that for a second. These people hate Jesus so much. They are ready to kill him without evidence, without a trial. And if there was one ounce of doubt that Jesus's miracles were authentic, don't you think they would have never shut up about it? They would have constantly said, no, he didn't really feed 5,000. It was like 12 people in a boat. It was one snack. He did not do that. That man, he walked before. He just had a limp. He wasn't really paralyzed. 
That man, oh, he was blind in one eye. He can, he can. No, but they never deny Jesus' miracles. There was an ounce of doubt that Jesus' miracles were authentic. Don't you think they would have denied them? I remember a few years ago, there was a church that made the news in Florida who claimed that by the power of God, people were being supernaturally healed at their church services. And they made such a buzz that 60 Minutes went to this church and they asked for three cases of miraculous healing because they wanted to investigate. They wanted to talk to family members. They wanted to get doctor's records. They wanted to see if they could authenticate the miracles that were actually taking place. And I remember the interview where the reporter was talking to one of the pastors and, and they said, you know, we just need three cases and we'll examine them and look at them. And the pastor said, I can give you thousands, thousands. We just need three. But I've got thousands. We'll just start with three. <laughs> at the end of the day, not a single case that the church could provide could be verified as an authentic healing. And the reason I share that story is that you need to understand Jesus had no such problem. When Christ performed a miracle, his miracles were so instantaneous so complete, so marvelous that no one doubted their authenticity. They were so public and so impossible to explain away that that Jesus' greatest enemies did not deny that his miracles were real. And that's why here, as the priests and the Pharisees and the Sadducees are plotting against Jesus, there's no discussion of whether Lazarus was actually dead and raised. In fact, They recognized that Christ's power was so convincing that they were worried. The whole country is going to start following this guy. And here we start to get the real reason why the religious rulers want to kill Jesus. They were worried about their own followers. They were worried about their own influence and their own power. And read on with me to verse 48. And and this becomes more clear. They say, if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. They were worried that once Jesus gets the whole nation to follow him, he's going to make himself king of Israel. And that was an ignorant thing to say because when they tried to make him king in John chapter 6, he ran away from them. Later, he's going he's gonna to face Pontius Pilate. And they said, he asked him, are you a king? And he says, my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus didn't come in his first coming as a political ruler. So that was a really ignorant accusation. But the problem with that, this is their fear. He's going to make himself king. And Israel was not a free nation at this point. They were under Roman rule and occupation. The Romans did give the Jews an enormous amount of freedom. They let them keep their religion, their cultural identity, as long as they they paid taxes and were loyal to Caesar. That's why in verse 48, they say, the Romans will come and take away our place. I think what they're talking about when they say place, they're talking about the temple. And the temple was the glorious place where God's spirit dwelt, or man could go to confess their sins and to offer sacrifices. But what these leaders missed is that something greater than the temple was here. These Jews were so worried about protecting their temple and their influence and their power and their position that they forgot that the temple itself was only meant to point to a greater reality that was to come. They only forgot that, that, that they as servants of God most high were not the point. It wasn't their show. It was God's show. And they were only servants. They're not worried about Jesus being the Messiah They're only worried about their power and their status. So they come up with a plan. Verse 49. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all. You idiots. Nor do you understand that this is better for you, that one man should die for the people, nor that the whole nation should perish. When I was a new Christian, I remember reading this verse and being very confused. Because in verse 50, you have one of the clearest summaries of the gospel in all of scripture. And that confused me because, because I remember thinking, wait, is Caiaphas a Christian? Is he rebuking them? Does he say, no, you don't understand. Jesus is the Messiah. He's going to die for our sins. But actually that's not what Caiaphas is, is doing at all. Verse 50 does sound like God so loved the world that he sent his only son to die for people so that whoever believes in him should not perish. It sounds like John's three sixteen, even in a way, but Caiaphas is in no way a Christian. 
In reality, what Caiaphas meant is, look, Jesus is going to start an insurrection and the Romans, they're going to come and kill all of us. So it's better that we kill this one man and that he dies rather than we all die. That's what he meant. That was the intention of his statement. On the surface, Caiaphas was simply being pragmatic. I don't think he understood the full weight of what he was saying. That's why John goes on in verse 51 and 52 and he writes, He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and not for the nation only, but also to gather into the children of God who were scattered abroad. God used Caiaphas as an instrument to communicate a deep truth, a truth so deep, in fact, that Caiaphas himself did not understand it. And when Caiaphas said it, there's probably no one in the room who understood it. But we know at least two Pharisees who later came to faith in Jesus who were probably in this council, namely Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. And I can imagine that later after Jesus died and rose from the grave and they're understanding the gospel and they've put their faith and trust in Jesus and the two of them talked about this council meeting and they realized that Caiaphas' words were profoundly true, just not in the way that Caiaphas meant it. You see, Jesus did die for people so they would not perish, but not to save them from the Romans, but from the wrath of God. You see, there's a day coming when God is going to hold us accountable for every time that we follow the sinful desires of our hearts. And that's not good news. If that happens, we are all goners because God is good and he is holy and he is the judge of all the earth and he will punish those who sin against him. But God desiring to show mercy, sent Jesus to live the holy life that you and I could not live. He suffered and died on the cross for the nation of Israel, but not just for the nation of Israel. He also died for the children of God scattered abroad. So now if anyone will humble themselves, recognize, turn from their sin and trust alone in Jesus' sacrifice, your sins will be taken away justified, declare righteous before the eyes of God, adopted as a child of God, part of God's children and family. Even if you're a dirty Gentile like I am, undeserving of God's grace and his covenants and his scripture. But Jesus died for the nation of Israel and for all the children scattered abroad. And it's amazing that God uses Caiaphas, who has such a wicked heart, He's dead in his sins and trespasses. He has not been born again. And God uses this man to communicate this glorious truth. You know, some people, how is that possible? Well, God does it all the time. Later, he would speak through Pontius Pilate, who said, this man is innocent. I find no fault in him. An unbelieving man who speaks profound truth. In the Old Testament, there were times where God spoke through kings, glorious prophecies who were unconverted like, like Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, there's even a time in the Old Testament, if you read the book of Numbers, where God speaks through a donkey. And almost every Sunday, God speaks through a donkey from this pulpit. And yet he communicates good and glorious truth. God uses this man to communicate this truth. And God does not stop here because if you know the story, he's actually going to use Caiaphas Later again, he's going to use Caiaphas as an instrument to kill Jesus. Listen closely. This is Acts chapter 2, verses 22 through 24. This is Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost. And he says, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. Everyone knew. He said, this Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. So God did that. God did the cross. But then Peter still says, you crucified him. And he, and he was killed by the hands of lawless men. They are responsible for the sins that they have committed. And God raised him up. What Caiaphas planned for evil, God planned for good in order to save sinners like you and me. In verse 53, it says, you read on with me, verse 53 and verse 54. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. And Jesus, therefore, no longer walked openly among the Jews, 
but went from there to the region near the wilderness to a town called Ephraim. And there he stayed with the disciples. Jesus' hour had not yet come. So he goes back into the country until it's the right time to die. But the decision had been made. We have to protect our temple and our nation. So this man must die. And the sad irony, if you know your history, is that in 70 AD, what these Jews feared actually did take place. Is that the Romans came against the city of Jerusalem, sieged it, tore down its wall, destroyed it, and then destroyed the temple. It just reminds me of so many churches who have abandoned the truth of God's word because it's not popular nowadays. I know many mainline liberal churches who have wandered away from the truth of the Bible to be more accepting and inclusive, and they've done all of this in the name of evangelism. I'm not talking differences like baptism. I'm talking, is the Bible true? And the great irony, again, is that those are the churches that are dying the quickest nowadays in America. Because you get rid of the word of God and you compromise on that and you no longer have a gospel. And if you no longer have a gospel, you have nothing to share. And if you have nothing to share, how is your church ever going to grow? We exist as a church to see God glorify and disciples multiply through the power of the gospel. We want to see this building filled and we want to see people get saved and we want to see people get baptized and we want to see people join this church and then we want to see those people go out and make more disciples, but not at the expense of the glory of God, not to compromise God's truth, not with any other message that is less than the gospel. Because if we compromise on those essentials, then, then none of the disciples we make will be worth making. And these religious rulers, they do not care about the glory of God. They plotted to sin against God by killing an innocent man because they loved their status and their power. And in the end, they lost it anyway because their hearts were so wicked that they lost all perspective. These rulers were so worried about their power and their status, they forgot that they were slaves at that moment to Rome. They forgot what true freedom was. And when the true Israel of King had arrived, they rejected him. And the wickedness of their hearts and our hearts often time causes us to lose all reason. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the chief priests, they should have realized that this man had the power to raise the dead. He just sent army after hour. He's just going to resurrect him. They're going to go for round two. Who can take on an army whose king can raise you from the dead? Surely this man could have freed them from the Romans. They should have recognized that God's Messiah was here. And they should have said, if God is for us, who can be against us? And that needs to be our attitude. Is that we don't need to follow the example of these pragmatic, compromising leaders. Sadly, that's not what they say. They're more concerned about their rights and their privileges and their wants and their desires. And it's, it's all me, me, me. That's where, listen, this isn't even in my, my manuscript or anything. As we think about where we are going in the future as a church, it can't be about what you want. It can't be about the traditions that we have in this church. It can't even be about what I want. This is not my church. This is Jesus's church. The question we need to be asking is what does the word of God say and what does Jesus want for this church? And if that's what our desire, we have a lot of reasons to be hopeful. We get back to this text. These, these, these people are so concerned with their rights and privilege that they respond to this miracle, this life-giving miracle with violent opposition. There's one final response to Jesus in the last couple of verses. Some respond to Jesus with shallow excitement. Look, look with me to verses 55 through 57. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. They were looking for Jesus and saying to one another as they stood in the temple, what do you think? That he will not come to the feast at all? And now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given order that if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know so that they might arrest him. The Jews who traveled down to Jerusalem, they weren't nominal. They weren't cold hearted. They were religious. They were devout. They were the followers of Moses. 
They obeyed the commands of scripture. They took time off from their work and family to travel to the temple and to offer sacrifices. And as the Passover is at hand, as they remember what God did for them and delivered them from Egypt and they killed that lamb and put its the blood over their doorway and God passed over their, their sins and did not judge them. And as they're celebrating that and there's this air of religious excitement, could this be the Christ? Where is he? And we'll see in a few weeks when Jesus enters the city, these very Jews will shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. But then about a week later, the same crowd, these same apparent followers in one sense, who had this shallow excitement, would shout, crucify him. Give us Barabbas. There always has been, and I think in a sense there always will be, a kind of shallow faith that cannot save. It's the kind of faith that is even outwardly religious, but inwardly they have not been born again. And these Israelites cared so much about outward purity and rituals and feasts, but they didn't know or care about inward purity of the heart. And it only took them a few days from this point to be willing to shed innocent blood. So my prayer this morning is that we would, as we have examined how the Israelites responded to Jesus, we could also rightly respond to him. Because in John 11, we found three responses to the raising of Lazarus. We saw true faith. We saw violent opposition. And we saw shallow excitement. So let me ask, how have you responded to the gospel of Jesus? I'd probably guess that if you're in this room, you're not violently opposed to Jesus. If you're planning to burn down this church, we have really good insurance, so joke's on you. (laughs) But it should be asked, do you have a true and lasting faith? Or is your faith shallow like this crowd at the end? Is your religion merely an outward performance or is it an inward reality? Well, this is a small church. I know everyone in here. I'm not suspecting and saying that. Like, I don't know your heart. This calls for self-examination, all of us. Examination of myself. Is your religion merely an outward performance or is it an inward reality? You've heard the facts. Jesus' miracles were undeniable even to his worst enemies. So how are you going to live in light of those truths? How is your life going to be different in light of John 11? Well, I have four pastoral charges for you, four ways that we can examine how the Israelites responded to Jesus so that we can rightly respond to him. First pastoral charge, believe in Jesus. That's clear from this, believe in Jesus. At the heart of the story is the news that Jesus came to save sinners. True God from all eternity, he took on flesh and became a man He lived a sinless life and performed countless miracles to prove that he was God's true messenger. And he went to the cross to die, not just for the sins of Israel, but for the sins of all the children of God scattered around the world. And he rose from the grave, defeating death, and he ascended to heaven where he sits at the right hand of God the Father. And there is a day coming where Jesus will return to judge the living and the dead. But if anyone here until that day repents and believes in Jesus, believes this message, You'll be saved and you will not perish. So believe. Second pastoral charge, abandon shallow religion. Abandon shallow religion. In the words of J.C. Ryle, let us settle it firmly in our minds that a religion which expends itself in zeal for outward formalities is utterly worthless in God's sight. The purity that God desires to see is not the purity of bodily washing and fasting, but a purity of heart. External worship may satisfy the flesh, but it doesn't promote real godliness. The standard of Christ's kingdom must be sought in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are those who are pure in heart, for they shall see God. End quote. Religion is necessary and good. Baptism is a blessing to the soul. Communion is a wonderful gospel ceremony, but they're worthless unless you've been born again. So abandon shallow religion and turn to God who can purify you inside and out. I said I had four, but I lied. I only had three. So this is the final pastoral charge. Rest in the fact that our God wins. Rest in the fact that our God wins. The nations may rage and plot and the kings of the earth may set themselves against the Lord and his Christ, his anointed. But at the end of the day, he who sits in the heaven laughs. 
Jesus was a threat to the Sanhedrin's power, and so they violently opposed them with everything they had. And they were not the last ones to violently oppose Jesus. In 300 AD, the Roman, the Roman emperor uh, Diocletian hated Christianity and tried to stomp it out. He burned thousands of copies of the Bible and decreed that any home with a Bible in it should be burned down. When he, uh, when he believed the last copy of the Bible had been burnt, he built a monument over that site and he declared proudly, the Christian name has been extinguished. The very next emperor in Rome was a professing Christian named Constantine. And one of the first things he did as emperor was commission scribes to make 50 copies of the Bible. About 500 years after Diocletian died, the tomb that he was buried in would become a Christian church. Our God sits in the heavens and he laughs. Voltaire, the great French philosopher, once declared, in 100 years, the, the Bible would be a forgotten and unknown no book. 100 years later, the Geneva Bible, the Geneva Bible Society occupied his home. And our God sits in the heavens and he laughs. American political leader Robert Ingersoll once proclaimed, in 15 years, I will have this book, the Bible, in the morgue. In 15 years exactly, Robert Ingersoll was in the morgue. And our God sat in the heavens and laughed. During the 1950s, the Soviet government, who outlined owning or studying the Bible, built a majestic building in Kiev, Ukraine, to house the communist headquarters for that region. That building would become one of the first Christian universities in all of the former Soviet Union. And our God sat in the heavens and he laughed. The nations may rage and plot and the kings of the earth may set themselves against the Lord and his anointed. But at the end of the day, he laughs. The chief priests and the Pharisees and the Sadducees plotted against Jesus. But in their plotting, they were only doing exactly what God had planned for them to do. And we should expect as we go out and we share our faith that some will believe some will violently oppose our message and some will have a shallow faith. But do not be discouraged because in the end, our God wins. You know why I have hope for Brant Lake? Because our God wins. He can send his spirit and save the least likely sinners at any moment. Remember that Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, two of those religious leaders who participated in this council, both eventually followed Jesus. Remember that on the day of Pentecost, of the Jews who cried out for Christ to be crucified, 3,000 repented of their sin and trusted in Jesus as their Lord that day and were baptized. If God could save them, then he can send, save your friends and your family and your neighbors. No matter how often we're rejected or violently opposed, we can remember that in the end, our God wins. Amen? Amen. Hi, Taylor Callen, pastor of Forkin Baptist Church. Thank you so much for listening to this sermon. I pray that you are more encouraged and love Jesus and the gospel more after hearing the sermon than when you first sat down to listen to it. Know that, that our heart at this church is that this sermon would be an encouragement to you and would be a useful resource, but would in no way replace the pastor that God has called to shepherd you or the church that you're called to be a member of. With that being said, if you want more information about our church or want to hear more sermons, go to horicanbaptist.com.